As I was uh, coming into Castle, um, one of the first things that I was able to be involved in is a strategic planning process. Um, we laid out a um, 2019 to 2021 a strategic plan that, that surfaced three um, interlocking uh, priorities. Those priorities, are, as you see on the slide, are equity, uh, adult SEL, and integration of academic and, and social and emotional learning instruction. Um, in order to uh, move, in order to acknowledge and celebrate all of the good work that you all have been doing, as well as other uh, colleagues, researchers, uh, scholars, and alike, uh, we first engaged in a landscape scan. Um, and we decided that a landscape scan, it would make sense to to scan the literature broadly. There is uh, a fairly narrow uh, social emotional learning literature that intersects with other literatures that are related. The task here was to try to create a, as rich an understanding of what people were doing, both basic and applied research, and then leverage that as we began to think about the revisions of our frameworks and our tools and then thought, of, thought about the ways in which we would move forward in the next phase of, of research, which includes partnerships uh, with uh, collaborators as well as uh, partnerships with districts, people that are already doing the work. Let's see here. So in, as engaging in that work meant first looking closely and carefully at the existing CASEL framework. This is the framework for systemic SEL. It's fairly ubiquitous in the field. Um, it's up in many schools. Uh, you know, there uh, is voluminous work. Uh, Roger and colleagues over time have been very productive in sharing out book chapters and journals and think journal articles and the like. Um, and so we wanted to start from uh, the great progress that the organization has already made. And so this uh, framework uh, was the point of departure for the work. Now, uh, the literature is, is now fairly broad. It ranges from neuroscience, brain science, and the like. There's a lot of work that's been done in that area. But it also includes uh, public health, work in economics, et cetera, et cetera. So, so the task was really to find a way to, how did that happen? Find a way to think about um, the organization of the literature that would make sense both for ourselves as well as for those who are working in the field. Again, field building being an important undertaking for Castle as always. So uh, we settled on the notion of, um, as you'll see in the last slide down at the bottom, engaged citizenship, which allowed us then to begin to backwards plan if a long-term outcome of engagement in uh, social and emotional learning uh, was indeed engaged citizenship, then that could serve as an organizing concept for, for, for the literature review that we were engaged in. It allowed us to envelop inside of citizenship all of the adult roles that we know young people uh, are maturing into, so work life, family. It also allowed us to, to understand the ways in which the current academic activity that they're engaged in is relevant to who they become as engaged citizens. So in looking at that literature, um, we simply leveraged uh, existing frameworks. Uh, this is uh, uh, Westheimer and Kahn's work uh, where they utilize personally responsible, participatory, and they call justice-oriented citizenship. And for us, if, if social and emotional learning is indeed part of a civic socialization process that leads to engaged citizenship, then we ought to be able to organize the literature based on this, uh, literature as well as activities based on this kind of, of, of organizing scheme. Um, each of these uh, ways of doing citizenship have implications for ways of doing SEL. So we would propose that there, at this point, there are forms of social and emotional learning that people are engaged in. This allows us to be cast a broad uh, uh, umbrella and bring people in under that umbrella and recognize all the very good work that's being done. Now, of course, 
SEL has implications for social justice. Many of the times when you talk about equity, people immediately see that as a social justice issue. But social justice in the social psychological literature has multiple dimensions to it. So we were able to align, for example, personally responsible SEL with interpersonal justice. It is about being nice to one another. Participatory SEL is about procedures and processes that you use inside of a classroom, for example. And that's procedural and restorative justice. We hit upon the notion of transformative SEL or justice-oriented uh, SEL as being most essential to issues of equ equity, which in the literature implies distributive justice and distributive justice around valued uh, goods and services, knowledge, power, um, money, resources, and the like. So we came up with a working definition uh, of uh, transformative SEL. And you'll see here it positions young people and adults as co-learners. Uh, critical examination of inequities is part of that definition. With a focus on um, solutions-oriented educational process that addresses personal, community, and societal concerns. This, this form of SEL links uh, intrapersonal, interpersonal, and institutional considerations, which is foundational in our view to transformative SEL. So we've done some work on competencies. Um, you know, earlier work, in earlier work, we um, offered up what we were calling equity elaborations at the time. Uh, here, uh, essentially, we understand, and I think the intention of uh, Roger and colleagues early on was to create the five competencies as buckets into which multiple constructs can be placed. And for our purposes, we simply went into those, uh, went into those buckets and pulled out, for example, under uh, self-awareness, issues of identity, um, under self-management, issues of agency, um, under social awareness, issues of belonging. And so, uh, we are about the business of trying to further refine and understand um, core competencies and also understand them both as issues of, of development for young people, children, and adolescents, but also issues for adults. Uh, we would imagine that these things are on a developmental continuum, and as we begin to talk about adult SEL, these are the kinds of things that are also germane to uh, working with educators or community people. Uh, we also laid out some pro programmatic um, um, insights, uh, realizing that in the literature, these are the kinds of, of uh, programs and, and, and practices that are, were most germane to the kind of competence development that we um, believe is appropriate under, the, uh, under transformative SEL. Um, you see here, the core, one of the, some of the core features are uh, both power sharing, adults, and, and students and families and other community stakeholders, but also rigor and relevance, because equity and excellence are intimately connected. So next steps in, next steps in our work, thank you very much. <laughs> next, steps in, next step in our work are, are clearly, um, you know, more definitional work, for further elaboration on the work that we've done uh, we had a recent paper published in a uh, recent uh, uh, edition of the Educational uh, Psychologist that kind of begins to lay out um, transformative SCL. And so I would encourage you to take a look at that. It's a little dense, but I'm an academic, so there you go. Um, so in, that, in the work, we're going to look at developmental trajectories and, and then processes across context. Um, we also are moving, pivoting towards research practice partnerships as an approach that allows us to leverage the, the practice wisdom that exists out in the field. Because in many respects, what my job is to create space and to um, learn from practitioners and base that in, 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 uh, in the evidence that exists or generate the evidence to, to better understand and iterate on the very good practices that are already occurring. Um, we have partners in this work, certainly the Collaborating the Districts Initiative is a, is a CASEL uh, initiative that has been going on for a number of years, but we are now involved with uh, colleagues 
um, Kathleen Alsta and Camille Farrington, um, Kathleen from the National Equity Project, Camille from the Chicago Consortium, and in, in intimately involved in trying to put our resources and materials on the table to figure out what's in the best interest of young people and refine frameworks, tools, et cetera. And thank you all. Um, ran a little over, but these are uh, key funders who are now supporting this work, and we look forward to partnership with you, thought partnership, as well as applied work in the, in the service of our young people. Thank you. So um, I'd like to invite to the stage my, uh, my colleagues. Um, we consider them the, uh, part of the next generation of young leaders. Um, this work is nothing without trying to uh, prepare other young people to assume leadership roles, um, birth through, um, through old age. And so I'd like to invite to the stage um, Dina Simmons, uh, Mina, Mina Srinivasan, sorry, uh, Taryn Ishada, and Roberto Rivera. Uh, Dina is assistant director of the Yale Center of, of, for Emotional Intelligence. Uh, she writes and speaks nationally about social justice and culturally responsive pedagogy, education reform, emotional intelligence, bullying, how to create emotionally intelligent and safe classrooms within the context of equity. Uh, Mina is Executive Director of Transformative Educational Leadership, or TEL. Prior to this role, she spent five and a half years as a program manager in Oakland Unified <clears throat> School District Office of Social and Emotional Learning. She is an author of SEL Every Day and Teach, Breathe, and Learn. Uh, Taryn is Executive Director of Californians for Justice, where she leads the organization um, in its mission to advance racial equity by building the power of youth, communities of color, immigrants, low income, and LGBTQ, non-gender conforming communities. Um, and Taryn's background is in philanthropy and youth organizing. And last but not least, uh, Roberto Rivera, artist, researcher, practitioner, specializing in the practice of, of engaging empirical research in SEL and equity and making it practical for transforming educational systems community, and communities internationally. His research currently focuses on how ecosystems can be created so traumatized youth can survive and thrive. He is a husband and proud father of two amazing boys, Phoenix and Justice. All right, how is everyone feeling? I'm a, little, I'm a little under the weather, but I'm so excited to be here to talk about how we think about SEL 25 years from now. And I'm going to speak from my heart today. I don't have anything prepared but slides, so bear with me. This is Dina from the heart, Dina from the Bronx. And when I think about the future, I cannot think about the past. I think about myself, a little black girl in the Bronx, and my experience and my journey to get to be standing right here right now and all the pedigree and social capital that I acquired and how damaged I am now and how every single day I pick up pieces of myself. So when I think about the future of SEL and I think about schooling and education in general, I have to ask this question. How can we practice and implement SEL to ensure that it doesn't cause harm? And I think it's important for us to know that most of the time where we do our education or schooling initiatives, it has happened within a broken system of education with a history of exclusion and inequity. Our schooling system is inequity by design. So when we think about what we implement and what we do, we have to think about the larger system and the larger context to ensure that we're not perpetuating the damage and the harm that is done to too many students like me. Too many students who look like me. And so I can't help asking the second question. What is our why? What is our why? And so some of us who've been here in these past two days have been thinking about, why are we doing this work? When I was at my pre-session, 
school climate came up, academic achievement came up. We know what the research tells us. But in my travels and the work that I've done with schools and districts throughout the nation, I have seen that that why changes depending on the students. So that when we're speaking about black and brown students, that SEL is about remediation. It is about saving black and brown children from themselves. It is about co compliance and following rules. But when I speak to other districts with privileged kids, it's about college and career readiness. It's about enhancement. So when we think about this work, and if our why is different depending on who we're speaking about, we have to ask ourselves, how are we complicit in injustice? How are we complicit in the harm and the damage that happens to our young people? Bettina Love talks about, she's from the University of Georgia, some of y'all know her. She talks about the spirit murdering of our young people. We have to ensure that this work that we do is not spirit murdering our children. But I will add, too, that many of the teachers and educators in the room are also, have also been spirit murdered. Every single day, like I said, I am picking myself up. It is important for us to know, too, good intentions don't equal good outcomes. Just because you mean well does not mean that the outcome is going to be good. I can't tell you how often, when I was growing up, going to boarding school in Connecticut, and how often people came to me and said, oh, Dina, you're so articulate. And I would say, and I would, and, and, and that was, the intention was good. But the way I received it was as if they didn't believe that I could be. Or how often people think my hair is awesome. Thank you all, I know. <laughs> and how often folks would, you know, put their hand in my hair. And how often I felt dehumanized or like a spectacle. Don't touch my hair. Good intentions don't e equal good outcomes. And my second point is that anything can be used as a weapon. I sleep with a bat near my bed because growing up I felt very unsafe when it got dark. A bat is for baseball, but I can use it as a weapon. So we have to be very careful and really critical about how we think about the work that we do and ensure that we're, we have a broken system. And if we don't think widely and strategically and deliberately about this system that is broken, anything can be used as a weapon. So this work of equity, of achieving equity, requires courage and discomfort. I know that some of the things I said today may make people feel a little uncomfortable. But it's through that discomfort that we grow. It is through that discomfort that we try to do better and be better. And I'll also just, since I'm speaking from the heart, every single day when I walk into this world, I feel uncomfortable. Because when I walk into the room, the first assumption that people have about me is not a positive one. So every single day I feel uncomfortable. How do we create and change the system so that the two gentlemen who spoke up here earlier today have different options. That is our work. And it's hard. And it takes courage, and it's going to be uncomfortable. How many of you are about that life? I want to hear from you. How many of you are about that life? So in closing, I would say for this work to happen, we have to apply an equity lens. Actually, you know what? We just have to start seeing what it is. We don't like to say what it is, because we don't like to talk about race in this country. We cannot heal our wounds if we don't tend to them. So we need to apply an equity and an anti-racist lens. So I leave you with one question, which is, how can we leverage SEL to create the social change that we need? That is not a question for you to not just to ponder, but this is an action plan for you. What is your action plan to ensure that we leverage SEL to create the social change we so desperately need? Thank you.
When I was 28, I was teaching in my ancestral homeland of India. My adopted city of New Delhi had been the site of numerous bomb blasts fueled by tension between Hindus and Muslims. Over the course of one month, there were five deadly attacks. Our school was under lockdown, and I was desperate for guidance on how to support my students during this tumultuous time. After a long school day, I attended a talk honoring the anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi's birth. The talk was held at the site of his martyrdom, and it lauded his commitment to nonviolent societal transformation. That evening changed my life. The speaker was the Vietnamese renowned global leader, Thich Nhat Hanh, who had been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And in a profound weaving of birth and death, he challenged us all to be Gandhi's continuation. And he introduced a term that's foundational to creating a beloved community, interbeing. Interbeing means to interdependently coexist. Interbeing honors the interdependence of every person to all other persons and aspects of our planet. We are all connected to each other, and our beloved community extends to our relationship with this planet. In a beautiful illustration of interbeing, Thich Nhat Hanh writes that if you were a poet, you would see clearly that there is a cloud floating in this sheet of paper. Without the cloud, there would be no rain. Without the rain, there would be no trees. And without the trees, there would be no paper. The cloud is essential for the paper to exist. He goes on to write that if you look deeply enough, you can even see the logger who cut down the tree and the logger's ancestors as well in that sheet of paper. Interbeing helps us see that we are all interconnected in a complex web, knowing that we are in each other. The nonviolence Gandhi and MLK practiced is born from interbeing. Dr. King wrote, in a real sense, all life is interrelated. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. This is the interrelated structure of reality. In the SEL world, we talk about needing to connect, but the truth is we are already connected. We just don't often recognize this. If we could shift our sense of self from a strongly individuated, separate identity to a connected, collective identity, then we will view our world, our nation, and the work we do in schools with fresh eyes. This vision is what transformative SEL is all about but it requires a major paradigm shift. This shift means that we attune to the intelligence of interbeing, and we acknowledge that the wounding of historic racism is our collective responsibility. We all must build bridges together so we can, as John A. Powell says, advance a world built on belonging. And we're starting as early as we can with our son. So how do we do this? Audre Lorde reminds us that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Transformative SEL, centered in justice, grounded in interbeing, will not only dismantle the master's house, but build a new house. That night in Delhi, on the anniversary of Gandhi's birth, at the site of his death. Thich Nhat Hanh led us through an exercise where we looked deeply into our hands to see our ancestors and our descendants. I touched my great-great-grandfather in me. He was a freedom fighter in the Indian independence movement, and he died at the hands of the colonizers. I felt how his struggle continues to live on inside of me and in the many forms colonization takes today. My father is a bridge engineer. 
And that night, I decided to follow in his footsteps, but build bridges that create a more compassionate and equitable world rooted in interbeing. I'm inviting all of us here today to be bridge builders. SEL is the how of bridging. We are living the legacy of our ancestors, those who chose to bridge, those who chose to break, and those who had no choice, like my great-great-grandfather and his fellow freedom fighters pictured here. My call to action for all of us is to hold in our hearts a question inspired by the work of one of my dear teachers, Larry Ward. What kind of ancestor am I willing to be? <laughs> Knowing that in each moment, there's an opportunity to bridge or break. I've learned that to make things come alive, we need to breathe them in. So as we silently ask ourselves this question and hold it in our hearts, let us take one collective breath together. What kind of ancestor am I willing to be? The answers are within us, and they are waiting to be heard. Damn. Wow. This is hard coming after all of that. That was beautiful. Um, I'm Tara Nishida. Um, I'm from an organization that does youth organizing, so I'm going to ask you all to participate a little bit with me, because that's what we do with young people. Um, we don't tend to sit in lunch rooms right, with young people for three-hour sessions. But I appreciate all of you, because you are sticking it out for this equity panel, and that really does mean a lot. So I'm going to talk a lot about growth today. How many of you remember what it felt like when you were younger to go through a growth spurt? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. All right, that's participation, thank you. <laughs> so in seventh grade, I remember my growth spurt. I was lying in bed, my legs were aching, I felt these pains in my body. And unfortunately for me, I don't know if you can tell, I'm five foot two. That was the first and last time I grew. <laughs> I've also had another growth spurt this year. This is a baby. It's also the cookies I ate on the table. <laughs> but I'm also going through a growth spurt, not just in my belly, but in my own equity consciousness, my own wokeness. Then given what's happening in our country right now, all of the things our panelists have spoken to, it's not, so much, it's not a matter of should we do better. It's a matter of how fast, how hard, and how well are we going to do better together in this room. So I want to share with you today what I've been learning on the ground, doing education justice organizing for over a decade with young people, specifically black, Latinx, Asian Pacific Islander, indigenous, queer and transgender, foster youth, and a term I learned yesterday, emerging multilingual students. I've learned that there are four key ingredients to doing equity work, to be on an equity growth journey. The first is relationships. How many of you in this room, raise your hand, feel like relationships are key to equity? All right, thank you, thank you. You've heard folks talk about it all conference long. It's not only relationships as key to equity and SEL, relationships are key to building an equitable, just, and sustainable society. But we're on the right track. I really do feel that from this conference. The second ingredient, student voice and agency. I also heard that a lot to, at this conference. So I want to hear some claps. I want to hear some noise if you're about student voice in your work. <laughs> yes! yes. <laughs> So I want people to realize student voice is not separate from equity. If you are serious about equity, that means you have to be serious about putting the people most impacted by inequity at the center of this work. 
And the people most impacted are not the superintendent, not the principal, even though those are the folks who tend to, to have the most say. It's actually our students, who, as you heard from folks, have been thrown into a system that was not designed for them to succeed. It was designed to sort privilege. It was designed to, to narrow opportunity for a, for a few. So equity re requir work requires that students are actually co-creators in advancing SDL with, uh, with adults. Not cutesy decision-making, as we heard from our superintendent yesterday, but real substantive change from the classroom to the state capitol, maybe even to Washington, D.C. So lastly, well, actually thirdly, sorry, I'm losing track. Third, a lot of what folks talked about today is that equity is not enough. We need to center race in, our, in equity. Even though I come from California and we're a liberal state, it is so much easier and more comfortable to talk about gender equity, to say homeless students, than it is to really talk and really learn and deeply reflect on the legacy of racism historically and today. So I want to read a letter from one of our students. She's a leader in Oakland. She says, Dear Racism in Schools, You've been around for a long time poisoning us all, but today I want you to know that you will no longer infect helpless students and teachers of color. We notice when you discourage us to dream and work hard by telling us we aren't good enough or that we aren't worthy. We notice when you make our educator hostile toward us because they feel scared or disconnected. We notice when we are passed over in award ceremonies and are presented the most improved award. You make us feel irrelevant. You make us feel guilty. You make me feel out of place, broken, hopeless, and worthless. You make us feel not human. Racism, I want you to end. Sincerely, Raquel Richardson. Thank you. So for us, to grow as an SEL equity movement, we all need to do better about centering race in our words, in our actions, and in our policies. So the last point I want to make is we need to take action. My only goal of flying across the country to talk to you all today is not to do the head nodding we all do at conferences, but to really take action when you go back home. We need to leverage the collective power and privilege we all have in this room and that we need to bring all of our friends along, our students along, our bosses along, our aunties and our cousins. Like, let's bring them all in. And we need to do two things. We need to do the work at an institutional level. At Californians for Justice, our students are leading a campaign called Relationship-Centered Schools that are asking people to invest in our school staff, asking them to value student voice and create spaces for relationship building. We're also pushing the state to reinvest $11 billion in school funding because we can't do this work without resources. Who's feeling that? Yes. And I think most importantly, we need to commit to doing the individual actions. And I'm saying this to you with a lot of humility because I've been on my own growth journey, as I've said this past year. I've been called in by my students, by our organizers, to wrestle with my own privilege and power to accept that I personally have furthered white supremacy and anti-blackness. And it's uncomfortable, but I'm actively building the muscle to be comfortable being uncomfortable. So why put all of ourselves through these uncomfortable growing pains, right? Seriously, why? <laughs> because on the other side of that work, on the other side of those individual and institutional actions is the kind of energizing and purposeful growth that is going to lead to our collective prosperity and liberation. Thank you. All right, good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Y'all doing all right? I am very honored and privileged to share the stage with these amazing folks. Can we give them another round of applause, please? Yeah. 
So I want to start off my piece by sharing a story about my best friend named Carlos. And Carlos' story fits the story of a lot of young people that fall in the cracks of our education system nationally and internationally. When he was in elementary school, he was given the label of being LD learning deficient. In middle school, his misdirected entrepreneurship skills got him kicked out. <laughs> Some of y'all caught that. He later ran away from home, got arrested, went through drug rehab, and even tried to take his own life. Anybody know a Carlos? Maybe they go by a different name, struggling to survive far away, not even thinking about thriving. Fortunately, this is not the end of Carlos' story. He later told me, big bro, I realized I wasn't LD learning deficient. I was LD, I just learned different. So let's practice that real quick. I want you to say, you're not learning deficient. You just learned different. And when he got that, he realized that he could approach schooling differently. He started emphasizing an education in the midst of schooling, started doing really well, eventually created his own major at some Big Ten university, redirected his entrepreneurship skills, named one of the top young change agents in America, and now my best friend, who was told he was LD, is publishing peer-reviewed journal articles and wrapping up this PhD. Now, as some of you already know, and some of you maybe have guessed, I'm very close to this Carlos. And this is very personal, because this is the story of Roberto Carlos Rivera. This is my story. And folks wonder how I went from being helpless and hopeless to being helpful and hopeful. How I went from being a dope dealer to what I call myself today, family, I'm a hope dealer. And I see some OG hope dealers in the house today. If you're a hope dealer, make some noise. <laughs> this transformation has been a journey. One that helped me learn how to think critically, to be more creative, and to use these things maybe you heard of called social emotional competencies to really take the trauma and the pain of my life and to flip it into a propane, to become a fuel that could empower me to want to make a difference in this world. But in all truth and actuality, I could have never learned these things on my own. I needed people in my life, like David B. said on the first night, who could actually see me, who could see the sculpture inside of the stone. Some of these people are here tonight. People who welcome me into community. People who welcome me into the beloved community. And some of these folks are here in the physical form, and some of these folks are here with the great cloud of witnesses that surround us. Give yourselves a round of applause if you know that you have someone who could see you, could see the sculpture inside of the stone. Let's give them a round of applause. So the last 20 years of my research and my practice in communities and districts and schools has helped me to understand that this notion of beloved community can be cultivated in all these various spaces. So I want to just share a quick story on how we cultivated beloved community right here in Chicago on the west side in a neighborhood called Lawndale, a neighborhood that King moved to one summer not too long ago. So there was a school that was utilizing some SEL curriculum and doing some service learning. But they couldn't get the kids to engage. They weren't doing the service projects, and they weren't on the track to graduate. So they called us in. And we did something very radical. I mean, you need to have an EDD and a PhD and some XYZ to do this. And that is we listened to the students. I know this is very sophisticated. And the students told us they were angry, they were frustrated, they were upset because they were believing the master narrative that their community was one of the worst communities in the city. The Chicago Tribune said that 
Lawndale was the millstone around the neck of the city. And they said, why are we going to go do service projects if, you know, we can't make any difference here in this community? And they had been divorced by the story that a generation earlier, some grandparents went on a hunger strike. CPS said they were going to build a school, and then uh, they built all the schools in the more affluent communities first, and they said they ran out of money. So they went on a hunger strike, and they got this school built, the very school these youth were in. And these elders were still around. So we got them to interview and to build relationship with the elders. A lot of these youth would tell us, nah, man, I'm not smart. But they were prolific poets and artists and musicians. And so we helped them to ask the question, not am I smart, but how am I smart? To connect those passions to multiple intelligences. And we brought in artists from the community to take these sparks of passion and the phantom into flame to help these young people to flex in the future, not just on a stage, but also on a page, right? To share their social and emotional realities in the form of blue storytelling. And pretty soon these youth were like, man, man, we got some content. So we connected the youth from South Lawndale, which is predominantly 99% Latinx, with the youth we were working with in North Lawndale, which is 99% African American. They organized an open mic at a church. This was supposed to last an hour. You think this lasted only an hour? This lasted for five hours. And the youth started bonding. They started imagining and realizing, man, we got some power here. What if we could change the narrative about this community in the face and in the eyes of the city? So they said, we want to do a block party. We want to do some. MC battles talking about issues going on in the community. We want positive performances. We're going to do some dancing right in between both neighborhoods, right? So they did a press release, and they got invited by KISS 103.5, popular radio station, on Friday at 6 p.m. Raise your hand if you think some people may be listening to the radio at 6 p.m. on a Friday. They had over a million listeners, and they got to talk about the beauty and the aptitudes the assets in the community that get overlooked. We had just heard that Curtis Blow, legendary hip hop artist, had agreed to come perform. People are calling in saying, hey, we you know, want more information. One guy called in and said, I'm gonna be honest, I wanna come see Curtis, but I'm a little scared to come to Lawndale. And the youth said, you don't need to worry. We got double security. I said, we do? They said, yes, we got it. Said, all right. So the day of the event, everybody's showing up from all over the city. And you know, Chicago's a very segregated city, so there's some tensions there, right? And the security we have, uh, they're looking a little nervous, and we're thinking, oh, Lord. Pretty soon a bus shows up, and the grandparents, the elders, the abuelitas start coming out. And they have yellow shirts that say security, but it's missing the eye, so it just says security. <laughs> security shows up. They start hugging people. They bought this hug life. You know, we've been talking about that. Big Mama giving folks the eye who looking kind of rough. You got chanclas that are coming out like boomerangs, coming around corners, hitting people on the back of the head who's like, oh, Mama. Raise your hand if you think there's any violence that day. But the core of this piece is not what didn't happen, but what did happen. And Curtis Blow was not the highlight. The highlight is the youth got the children to share their dreams of the community on the stage. There's a full-length documentary film that the youth created about this event, which you can find at the hashtag SEL, Beloved Community. You can check it out. And what you see happening, family, at the end is something so powerful. Sean Jenright talks about that the travesty of oppression is that people lose the capacity to dream. And what you see happening in this film, particularly at the end, is a defibrillator coming out between the youth and the adults Stand back, clear, boom, awakening this community muscle to gain the capacity to dream again. And in the background, you see a fire station. It's abandoned at this moment in time. And the community starts dreaming about using this as a fire station for the arts. So they come together, they raise a couple million dollars. Chicago Cred now is running programs out of the Firehouse Community Arts Center. The school sees the agency of the youth so they engage the youth to involve themselves in the hiring and firing processes 
of staff. Raise your hand if you think this may be impacted the culture and climate of the school. <laughs> Needless to say, all the youth involved with this graduated. Many matriculated into college, and a few recently graduated with their master's degree. Raise your hand if you see any competencies taking place in this case study. Any self-awareness? Any self-management? Social awareness? You got any positive relationship? What about responsible decision making? You see all five, put all five up in the air. What about any intergenerational collaboration? Multicultural collaboration? What about any shared agency and voice? I believe that SEL and equity at its best is expressed through beloved community. Because it's in community that we go from surviving to thriving. Thank you, family. Um, so we want to um, engage in a little question and answer before we open it up more broadly for questions. So I'm going to start it off. I'm going to ask my colleague, uh, Dina, a question. And then she will proceed and we'll move on down the line. So uh, Dr. Simmons, Dina, um, you've spoken and written about the need to teach SEL in the context of social political realities. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Um, clarify and elaborate on why you think that's important? Well, first, okay. So I, 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 all I have to do is think about Roberto and the story of, of so many children if when they're seen or when we're seen oh, and our stories and our histories and our realities are part of our instruction, what, how that changes the outcomes. Mm -hmm. I think too often we, we think that we can just implement something without understanding the reality and the groundedness and the context the context that sometimes those can be damaging if we don't know. Mm. Um, I think we have to really reflect on, especially in our education system, whiteness. We have to understand what we have to understand all of the dominant narratives and how damaging that can be for our young people. So it's true. I think it's crucially important to have the socio-political context and to think about how we can use social emotional learning to have those courageous conversations those important conversations that we really like to shy away from. Um, I always tell people, you can't SEL away oppression. Mm. SEL and equity is not the same thing. I think we tend to conflate the two because it's easier to talk about SEL and to do the SEL work. And sometimes when we put equity under SEL, we don't do the equity work. And I think we have to be willing to do the equity work and understand that it's different but important and that they can help each other. And so we have to understand how they interconnect, how they, how they can, we can leverage either to do the work, but we cannot lose this equity work. Because I wouldn't be here if it weren't for someone helping me. But like I said already on my journey here, I have lost so many pieces of myself because my schooling was in a, a schooling that constantly told me that I was not enough. So every day I'm trying to find my enoughness. And so many of our students and so many people in this room today can share their own stories where they were erased. And that erasure is traumatizing. And so we have to understand how we can leverage social emotional learning skills to have these very difficult conversations that we like to avoid because we'd rather be comfortable. Right, to my hermano, Roberto. What's up, sister? Oh, all right. We family up here, by the way. Yes. So, you know, we're going to have fun. Yes. So, I first met you in, is it Austin, Texas? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so shout out to Austin, homies. All right. Anybody from the Bronx here? You got to keep Austin weird. What? what? One person from the Bronx, it's okay. We're mighty, small and mighty. So, Roberta, we've been talking about, and I think, you know, our sister here brought up this yeah. idea of, like, calling in and calling out. And we've been seeing a lot more uh, calling out happening against injustice and problematic and oppressive institutions and sort of behaviors. Now, how do you think we can begin to call folks in? Mm. And those who are in, how do we call them more in? 
It's a good question. Um, I'm a quote guy. I love quotes. And uh, the first quote that comes to mind is a quote from Paulo Freire. Y'all know who Paulo Freire is? Brazilian educator, the godfather of critical education. If you see pictures of him, he looks like Santa Claus. But you know, this guy's an OG, man. He's nothing to mess with. Uh, he talks about the purpose of education is to become fully human. And he says, when we're born in this world, because of oppression, we uh, are broken and we're, we're dehumanized, right? And he says, it's not just the oppressed that are dehumanized in the act of oppression, but the oppressors are also dehumanized in this process. He says that the oppressed regain their humanity through education. But get this, he says the oppressor can never regain their humanity without the help of the oppressed. Tim shared a, a quote, and I had to write it down. I think it was it Lila Watson? She says, you know, and I think about this coming from our youth. If you've come to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you've come because your liberation is bound up with mine, let's journey together. So what we're talking about, you know, and what Rob and Melissa so wonderfully laid out is this notion of interconnectedness. Mina talks about this inner being. But there's an, uh, a reciprocally transformative process that's waiting to happen in these relationships, right? And so as we kind of overflow and we start thinking about how do we transform, uh, you know, equity and, 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 and uh, uh, inequitable racist spaces, we got to remember that uh, there's three different layers to racial inequity. We got the institutional piece, which Kumba links. Let's give them another round of applause. They touched on very powerfully. And we know that there's a disproportionate number of students of color who are being disciplined and how this relates to them dropping out and young folks being more likely to end up incarcerated. There's the interpersonal acts of bigotry, right? Police brutality, these tiki torches, and even sometimes more subtle, these microaggressions that happen in the classroom. Then there's the intrapersonal aspect, where folks legitimately feel like they're less than. When I was in elementary school and told that I was LD, my family moved eventually to Texas. And my transcripts didn't follow right away, because this was before you know, we had Google Docs and all that. And I advocated, as an elementary school student, to be in the slow and remedial classes, because I felt this was my level. And so when we think about transformation on the institutional, interpersonal, and intrapersonal level, this is something that's too much, it's too overwhelming to do on our own. And this is why we need beloved community. We need what folks were talking about, you know, to cross these bridges that are generational, cultural, these bridges of, of power, right? And I think the purpose of beloved community is best captured in, in the sense that uh, this term that one of my mentors shared with me, Baba Rogers out of Milwaukee. He said that they're creating this beloved community and they're involved in the work. He introduced this term, communitas. And I was like, well, what's communitas? He says, communitas is when a diverse group of people embarks in a dangerous journey to change the world. But they know they will be transformed in the process. And so this requires us coming in, being invited in, having proximity. Because proximity allows for the cultivation of empathy. If you're not close, you can't cultivate empathy. And from empathy, we can achieve the fruit of equity. So in agreement with you, sister, there is no equity without empathy. And there's no true empathy without the overflow and the work towards equity. All right, Sister Taryn, got a question for you. So your organization, Californians for Justice is a key leader in advancing a campaign for relationship-centered schools through building conditions and coalitions of marginalized young people. How can we best be allies and partners to young people in this work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think everyone here feels they work with students, for students, and I think we all need to move to working with students. <laughs> it's a small word, word change, but it's really powerful. 
Um, I know everyone who comes into education or working with young people, whatever you do, you came into this work because you cared about their futures, you cared about their success. But I think too often adults, adultism is a thing. You know, we think we know best, right? Or we come in, um, we come in with like a savior, a superhero mentality. And I think the first thing I've learned is just no capes, right? When you work with young people, if you're an adult, you can't look at this as if you are going in to save them, Come on. that they are fragile, that they don't know enough, right? You really have to see um, the fullness of their wisdom, maybe different than yours, but it's there. So I think a couple of practical things what I've seen be the most effective youth and adult partnerships to do that co-creation I talked about earlier is exactly what you said. You have to be willing to stick through for the long term, to work through the messiness. Student voice, student leadership, if you're doing it right, it gets messy. That's how you know you're doing it right, that there is conflict. Um, like the young people yesterday, if that made some people in the audience uncomfortable, our young speakers we had yesterday from Chicago, that's actually right on. That means they are challenging us, that we've created the space for them to speak their truth. <laughs> and my second practical tip is not as sexy as that. It's creating structures that last. So too often we have a great champion at a school or at a district who's all about student voice, and then they leave, right, as, as is the nature of our schools. And those structures don't stick around, and that process for like meaningful student voice doesn't stick and it isn't accountable to the people with the most power. So that's the second thing. And lastly, I just wanna say, something that I've been challenged with lately is a lot of the folks who are allies to our young people, um, you know, folks that we really do count among our friends, there's a, there's a degree to which they're comfortable. And a lot of it comes down to tone policing. Have you ever heard that term, tone policing? So it's like, I didn't mind what they were saying, but the way they said it made, it made me uncomfortable. Or the fact that she said it at your school board meeting and my trustees heard it, that, that's where we have to cut off student voice. And I think if we start to police where student voice, what tone student voice is acceptable and not, that's when we have created inequity once again, that we are creating harm. So I get a question for Mina. Mina, you actually lead an organization with Transformative in its name. Um, and you, it was formed to support education leaders, right? Um, to advance transformation towards equity through SEO. So what are the most important reasons you're working on building a pipeline of leaders, particularly leaders of color, to be the champions of SEO? Thanks, Karen. And I Taryn, I just wanted to acknowledge it's so wonderful to, to finally meet you in person because when I was working in Oakland, I had the opportunity to work with some amazing youth from Californians for Justice. So thank you for the powerful work that you're doing. So the organization that I lead, Transformative Educational Leadership, or TEL for short, um, is centered on the integration of leadership, equity, SEL, and mindfulness or inner work in service of systems transformation. And our participants are, are not just school leaders. We have central office leaders, school leaders, but also CBO, nonprofit leaders, teacher leaders. Uh, we're really trying to expand uh, who we see as having power. And I think that's really important if we want to affect change. Uh, Rand recently came out with a report. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. It just came out in the past month or so that 80% of our school principals are white, and 40%, about 40% of those leaders said that their pre-service programs left them completely or mostly unprepared to serve diverse populations. Wow. And that's extremely problematic if more than 50% of our student population are kids of color. So our organization is really trying to fill a gap in the field and really trying to support not just building a pipeline for leaders of color. Our first cohort were 40% leaders of color. Our next cohort hopefully would be 50% leaders of color or majority leaders of color. Um, but also creating a space for white leaders to 
do powerful work around their privilege and their white identity. Um, you know, I think it's something important that we need to talk about. I have a, a mentor who, um, who told me that she realized she was white 11 years ago. So she has an 11-year-old white identity. Wow. But, you know, it's a powerful way of thinking about her identity process. And so the leaders in our program, you know, to, to get to transformation, we have to move through pain. We have to move through discomfort. That's the only way we're going to be the leaders that are implementing anti-racist policies, procedures, and practices in our schools. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, a, a focus of our work is also on mindfulness. And mindfulness isn't solely about self-care. It's about, you know, coming from a foundation of understanding and practicing um, with the sense of interbeing that I spoke about earlier. Uh, and it also helps with embodiment. Uh, I was in Oakland Unified for five years on the SEL team, and probably the most important lesson that I learned was that leadership is key. To be a leader for and of SEL, you need to embody these skills and competencies. And one of the most powerful ways we can do that is attending to our inner lives, right? Our behavior is based on our beliefs. So we need to really do that inner work and check our beliefs and really examine what our beliefs are. You know, um, the, the teacher I mentioned before, Larry Ward, um, he has a beautiful saying. He, he talks about how if you're a revolutionary at heart and if you're in this room here today, you are. You can either appear like a comet and be a brilliant light that vanishes quickly or you can be like the sun, always returning. Hmm. So attending to our inner work is how we can be like the sun. And transforming our educational system isn't going to happen with comets. Mm. We must all be like the sun. Mm. The brother of. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank you for all the powerful work you're doing at Castle and the Equity Elaborated competencies. It's been a long time coming, so thank you, Brother Rob. And I'm just curious, um, as, a, as a researcher, how do you see this being operationalized in the field? Well, I think, um, so thank you for the question and thank you for the kind words. It's um, um, an honor and a, and a responsibility to try to advance the work and. Uh, document and reinforce some of the things that you all have been um, uh, sharing. Um, as a researcher and someone that works in a, an organization that's really concerned about evidence base, right? And we have to interrogate, you know, what is evidence and who's evidence and those kinds of things. Um, being able to uh, systematically put in place and iterate on, continuously improve the work, I think is germane to all forms of SEL, especially transformative forms of SEL, um, because the work is so difficult and we do need uh, self-care and support. And um, um, uh, so, so it's important to be able to gauge the types of progress or the challenges that we face so we can get the requisite support so we can uh, do what's in the best service of young people to create the next generation of informed and engaged um, citizens. And so I think f f on our side, it's, it's uh, identifying bright spots. And, you know, I mentioned earlier the uh, work with uh, colleagues, so both inside of the, uh, the um, collaborating districts and collaborating states work that we do at Castle, but also in collaboration with uh, Camille and Kathleen and the Bell and, and NEP networks, uh, we're looking, really looking for bright spots where we can begin to better understand um, how, to, um, how, to, how to do what's in the best interest of educators so that they can then do what's in the best interest of young people. Uh, that project, Equitable Learning and Development Project, is really grounded in our shared assumptions about what is healthy development for adults and for young people. It is framed with regard to issues of equity that I think we, um, it's always underappreciate. You know, most, most of the time when you say, when one uh, uses the term equity, people immediately think of black and brown kids or people that, are, you know, 
uh, uh, under-resourced, but there are class issues, there are gender issues, et cetera. You know, I was fortunate enough to be in a, a similar kind of meeting where uh, a colleague who works in rural communities said, well, the things that you describe as being problematic in urban communities are actually manifesting themselves in our communities as well. So there are a lot of, of um, dispossessed, underserved young people and communities where issues of equity, and you know, anytime you walk into a room, it could be racially homogeneous, but there's a lot of variability within that room based on issues of identity. Um, and so, for example, and so I think that really documenting and laying out and looking at changes over time in those things that we value most, um, I think is, is, is part of our work and it's a way of, of, of uh, celebrating, documenting, and then di broader dissemination of the very good work that's already going on. All right. Thank you all for submitting your questions. The first one, how do you respond to someone who says anti-racist work is not inclusive of conservative students and families? Dina, you wanna take that one? Oh, <laughs> all right, okay. Um, so thank you for asking that question. It's a question that I think many of us who do this work receive often. And I don't like to, I don't think the dichotomy is conservative versus radical, I think we have to ground ourselves in the beloved community and understand that racism or anti uh, or bias is actually dehumanizing and that the work is actually the dichotomy is dehumanizing versus humanizing mm -hmm. and so if we can begin to shift the language that this anti-racist work or this anti-bias work is allowing people to be mm -hmm. to thrive and to be their full selves and to be authentic and to be safe in their trueness that's the work. And so I would just say, we're just humanizing. We're creating the, the, the greater humanity in the work and allowing people to see each other, that seeing, that belonging, and that humanity. Thank you. That was a hard one. Um, another question, how can white people of privilege be change agents without reinforcing a savior mentality versus breaking barriers to the empowerment of the oppressed? Uh, who wants to take that one? Let them I'll, I'll jump in. All right, Rob. In. Um, I, I think that um, what, what this ultimately is about, is, as Dina has pointed out and has been reiterated over and over again, is about hu humanization, like humanizing uh, of, of ourselves. Now, certainly, um, you know, power, privilege, uh, disenfranchised, those are real. Uh, those are real, they're real and they're felt very deeply by an increasing number of, of, of American citizens regardless of their complexion. Mm -hmm. And so people who have resources, who have access, um, can be helpful simply by A, doing that inner work and recognizing the privilege, but then also figuring out ways of providing access and sharing those resources in ways that allow those furthest from opportunity to experience some opportunity such that they realize their talents and interests. Mm -hmm. Can I just add yeah. that when we, when we talk about the work of equity, we're talking about redistributing resources so that there's greater fairness. And so I think the reason why we're still talking about equity and not about liberation mm. is because we haven't, gotten, we haven't gotten equity yet because in order for equity to happen, we, all of us, need to be willing to give something up. We need to be willing to give up our comfort. We need to be willing to give up our seat at that Ivy League school. We need to be willing to get out the way. And too often we're so focused on hoarding and that's mine and I worked for it and therefore I'm not sharing it. Equity is about redistributing resources so that the outcomes are different and seeing the common humanity in each other. So again, I always ask folks, what are you willing to give up? I can chime in real quick too, yeah. Uh, you know, I think it's important to kind of reference some of the positive psychology literature um, that looks at, you know, a few different approaches to happiness. Uh, you know, there's one definition of happiness centered around pleasure. You know, folks who like to feel good no matter the cost, you know, drink the drink, be the center of attention, maybe spend a little bit too much money. If you look at the construct of fulfillment, it's pretty low for people who define happiness in this way. And then there's the path that's more centered on achievement, right? Uh, folks who know how to set and achieve positive goals and 
you know, maybe they graduate high school and college and get married and have 2.5 kids with a house with a white picket fence. I don't know how you have 2.5 kids, but evidently you can. And that fulfillment level is just a little higher than folks on the track to, you know, pleasure. Then there's this other track, which is the track of people who define happiness as far as living for something larger than yourself, trying to leave a, a legacy, trying to have an impact. And when you look at the level of fulfillment for people on this track, it's the highest, right? And so when we talk about this inner being, when we talk about what's happening with equity right now nationally and internationally, this is a huge opportunity for people who have privilege to experience a significant amount of fulfillment, their liberation and empowerment is bound up with the liberation and empowerment of people who are on the other side of this quote unquote achievement gap. And we gotta remember, as we talk about the achievement gap, we oftentimes frame and, and talk about the black and brown youth. But if we look for a second at the youth that we wanna compare the black and brown, brown folks to, some of these youth have gone off to Ivy League colleges. Some of these youth have gotten jobs at blue chip corporations on Wall Street. Some of these people have had it in their minds that they're now gonna you know, make money for their stakeholders no matter what the cost is. Even if they have to come up with balloon interest rates and subprime mortgages and bankrupt the whole world. And so I think what Roger and others you know, were talking about in the future of SEL is we have to redefine success. We have to redefine happiness. We have to redefine the purpose of what education is in the 21st century. And this is about all of us getting free. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just, wanna, I just wanna say really quickly on this question. Um, I mean, the truth is the majority of our education system continues to be led and taught by white folks. And so we really need our white folks um, to step up and really take responsibility for their own inner work and journey. I think too often um, what I've experienced is like folks of color end up being responsible for educating, right? Why, why was that N-word I said bad? Like, can you explain more? You know, why did this thing I did um, like harm those students? And I think we all need to take our own personal responsibility for doing that. I put up a, white, a book called White Fragility. How many of you have read it, looked at it? Okay, well we need everybody, 100% of you to raise your hand next year. Um, it's, a great, it's a great book. I think it especially speaks to folks in education because we, we are good folks. And being racist and naming your own racism and privilege doesn't make you bad, right? That's just the reality of the, of the world we swim in. So I think that's a great resource. Everyday Feminism, if you're not into books, you like shorter articles like myself, Everyday feminism is a great way to see the intersectionality of race and identity, of gender, et cetera. Um, so I'd recommend that. And um, I saw a lot of really great trainers at this conference around the topic of racial equity. For those who are trainers for, for this topic, I really push you all to work hand in hand with folks of color who've been doing racial justice and racial equity for a long time so that you can make sure you aren't causing further ha harm in this field. Okay. Uh, we have time for just one more question, and I'm going to direct it to you. All right. Oh. So I was gonna... maybe you can do a two-part answer. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, Mina, I'm going to direct this one to you, given your experience in the Oakland School District. How do you leverage support for the importance of SEL and equity in a school district where it isn't seen as a priority from the top? All right. Well, I'm going to answer that question. But first, <laughs> I just wanted to say that you know, in our program, we actually had racial affinity groups and we had white affinity groups and it's very, very important for white folks to come together and talk with each other and have a safe space for them to talk with each other. That being said, you know, we talk a lot about safe spaces. We need to be able to come back together and use our SEL skills in a brave space to move through that discomfort so we can actually build a beloved community. Um, and with respect to this question, one of the first things that come to mind for me is I think so often we have this sense of like, well, the superintendent isn't bought in, so there's no way. Well, what about the union? There are more teachers in school districts uh, than there are you know, leaders. And so I think really looking at the importance of 
Um, but we all have power throughout the system. So often we think it's just the superintendent or central office. And so the union and students, you know, students ultimately need to be driving the direction that we're going in. Great, thank you.